actions and the consequences. These are the decisive moments in time, the epic struggle that has shaped modern culture and inspired the human spirit. The pursuit of a dream in search of something greater. These are the tales of our ancestors, cloaked in shadow and living on as folklore. Molasses isn't just used for grandma's cookies or for grandpa's rum. It's also used for weapons, high explosives, and munitions when it's refined to industrial grade alcohol. And the United States Industrial Alcohol Company during World War I saw that this was a profitable market. And their subsidiary, the Purity Distilling Company, wanted to get in on the action. In the north end of Boston, Arthur Gell, treasurer of the Purity Distilling Company, realizes that he has to build a tank. You see, he's purchased a boatload of molasses that's heading north from the Caribbean, and he's got no place to put it. He commissions the Hammond Iron Works Company, and he doesn't pull a building permit. He only pulls a permit for the foundation. Therefore, he's not scrutinized by any building inspectors. So the Hammond Iron Works puts together 18 huge steel plates with rivets, and they build this magnificent tank. It's 58 feet tall, 90 feet in diameter, a 240 foot circumference, and they're gonna fill it with molasses. Only one problem, that ship is inbound, and if they don't have that tank built, the ship will dump the molasses that they paid for into the harbor. Well, December 1915 is a tough year weather-wise in Boston. Two major snowstorms, one dumping 20 inches of snow in Boston, along with some casualties on the construction site, make the deadline move closer and closer and closer. Finally, as the ship is pulling into Boston Harbor, the tank is complete. Arthur cuts some corners. Instead of filling the tank to the top with water to test the structural integrity, he decides to only fill it six inches high. And Arthur declares it sturdy, sound, and ready to use. Bring us the molasses. Isaac Gonzalez, a technician, noticed the molasses seemed to be congealing around the rivet joints and it started to seep from the seams and roll down the side of the tank in rivulets. He noticed children going to the base of the tank, taking sticks and putting the molasses in their mouths. They were getting on their clothes. Well, he brought this to Arthur Gell's attention and Arthur said, "Never mind, we'll repaint it gray. And that's what they did to cover up the molasses stains. Another technician noticed when he leaned against the tank that he heard this low rumbling noise that sounded like the growl of an angry animal. Another leaning against the tank swears that he could hear a heartbeat and that the tank was undulating in and out, in and out. There was something wrong. This wasn't molasses fermenting. No, no, it was bubbling inside. This was an ominous sign that something was wrong with the integrity of the tank. In 1919, the Malero is offloading nearly 2 million gallons of molasses into the tank at 529 Commercial Street. On January 12th, the temperatures are freezing near zero. The following day on the 13th, they swing 35 degrees and they're in the low 40s. By January 15th, it's a beautiful day in Boston. The sun is out and it's nearing lunchtime. The whistle sounds all around 529 Commercial Street. It's bustling, it's Boston's North End. Mrs. Clority is hanging her wash. Her cat Peter sits on the doorstep. Mrs. O'Brien is planting geraniums. Little Maria Dostasio is near the train tracks collecting free firewood. And then suddenly, a low rumble shook the ground. It sounded like thunder and got louder and louder and louder. In the freight yard, people looked at each other and suddenly, the ripping, tearing, and machine gun sound of steel bolts being snipped at their butts. Something's happening with the tank. There's a booming roar and a 
40 foot wave of molasses is unleashed. Death all around. No chance to react. It crushes freight cars like toys, topples buildings. Anyone caught in the path of this wave is devoured. When the noise and the rumbling stopped, there was a thick pool of molasses spread over where 529 Commercial Street used to be. By sundown, 15 bodies are recovered, six more the following morning. 150 people would be injured. Later, there are lawsuits. In fact, 3,000 witnesses come forward, and the lawyers try to deflect the blame from the United States Industrial Alcohol Company and Purity Distilling. It wasn't the infrastructure of the tank. It was anarchists. They planted a bomb. And they get off the hook for the great molasses disaster. Legend has it, on hot summer days, you can still smell that bittersweet molasses scent that harkens back to the great molasses flood of 1919. There's more to come on The Folklorist. My name is folklorist Bob. Once upon a time, there was an astronaut named Neil Armstrong. He went on Apollo 11 up into space. He was planning to get to the moon. I was there with him, and it was awesome. Neil Armstrong reporting the rolling pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. When we got on the moon, Neil Armstrong said, one step for man and one leap for mankind. That's one step for man. Then he put the American flag on the surface to represent that it was America's. He was the first American to step on the moon. I'm pretty sure you couldn't accomplish that. I've come a long way to tell you what really happened the night of March 5th. 1770, the Boston Massacre. Come with me. Historians will point to the Boston Massacre as the precursor to the American Revolution. Actually, it began 11 days earlier. You see, on February 22nd, 1770, a group of young boys huddled outside a loyalist merchant shop that was selling British goods. A British Customs Service agent by the name of Ebenezer Richardson happens to walk by and he's hit in the head with a rock. He goes back to his house, gets his musket, heads up to the second floor of the shop and fires into the crowd of young boys, striking young Christopher Sider in the head and in the chest. He passes later that evening. The American Revolution had begun. Four days later, on February 26th, 1770, a crowd of 5,000 colonists turn out for young Sider's funeral. Flowers are thrown on a young boy's grave. Samuel Adams says that here is the first martyr of the American Revolution. The American Revolution has begun. It's the evening of March 5th, 1770. A light snow is falling on the city of Boston. A young man by the name of Edward Gehring calls out to a British officer and says, you failed to pay my master. You owe him money. Pay your bill. Well, Private Hugh White of the 29th Regiment of Foot comes to the defense 
this British officer's honor and strikes young Gehring to the ground. Gehring calls out for help, and one of the first men on the scene is young Henry Knox. Knox says to White, if you fire, you will die. Well, suddenly, the crowd surrounds young White, and he in turn calls out for help. Word gets back to his commanding officer, Thomas Preston of the 29th Regiment of Foot. He shows up with eight British soldiers. They get on the stairs of the Customs House, and they form a semicircle. The crowd has swelled to over 400 people. The church bells are ringing, and the crowd is yelling to the British officers to fire. More townspeople turn out, thinking that the city of Boston is ablaze. They even bring me buckets. Suddenly, someone strikes Private Hugh Montgomery on the head with a club and knocks him down. The crowd swells, daring the British officers to fire. And suddenly, somebody does. Bodies fall to the ground. Damn ye, rascals! Why did ye fire? But they were saying to us, damn you, you fire on us, challenging us. Three men lay dead where they stood. Samuel Gray, a ball to the head. Crispus Attox, two balls to the chest. And young James Caldwell, two to the back. Young Samuel Maverick would pass away. Patrick Carr, five dead, 11 shot. The Boston Massacre is over but the American Revolution has begun. There's one word to describe the atmosphere of the Boston Massacre. Confusion. Benjamin Frizzell swears he saw the whole thing. He says that he heard three shots ring out from the second floor of the Customs House. Young Edward Manwaring an indented servant to Charlotte Borgate claims that he was forced to fire from the second floor of the Customs House into the crowd. In fact, on the engraving of Paul Revere, there is a muzzle and a flash. Was there another gunman in the Boston Massacre? My name is Folklore Shane, and this is the story of the Titanic. The RMS Titanic was a British design, ocean liner. On April 10, 1912, the Titanic set still. It took more than a hundred people and crew. A couple days later, the death of 1,500 people happened when it hit the iceberg. It started to sink. Soon the whole left side was underwater. No one knew what to do. The bulkheads started falling off. They were going to die. There were only 700 survivors. The winter of 1780 was one of the coldest on record in New England. It was also one of the snowiest. The Continental Army, led by George Washington, was encamped in Morristown, New Jersey, and they suffered unspeakable hardships. There were 11 consecutive days of below zero weather in Hartford, Connecticut. It even snowed in New Orleans. All of the rivers, lakes, and harbors of New England were frozen solid. 1780 was an odd year. 1780 was also the year of New England's dark day. There's more to come on The Folklorist. On May 18th, 1780, the sun was an unusual red color. This was the eve of New England's dark day. A dark cloud bank had obscured the sun. Later that evening, the wind changed from the west to the east and it brought in a fog bank. As dawn came, the skies were clear, but by 10 a.m., the obscuration had begun. A black mist had blotted out the sun. Morning had surrendered to night. Panic sets in. A sheet of white paper can't be read and blends in 
with the darkest black velvet. Children are dismissed from school. Workers are sent home from their jobs. Churches begin to fill. Sermons preach that this was God's retribution to the American colonists for trying to disavow their parent land, England, in a war of revolution. That night, it was dark. There wasn't a star in the sky. And suddenly, the black clouds parted. And there was the blood red moon. The end was indeed at hand. Repent, repent. In a tavern in Ipswich, Massachusetts, a local journalist who goes by the moniker Vieter is having an ale with a friend. They recognize the darkness is strange, but certainly not supernatural, and they walk outside the pub to investigate. They smell smoke. The friend insists that it's a chimney burning, but Vieter recognizes that smell as burnt leaves. He walks over to the horse trough and sees a layer of scum. It's black soot. Vieter knew that the end wasn't near. He recognizes that a major forest fire must be blowing over New England, causing the dark day. But Vieter was going to keep his opinion to himself. He didn't want the pious church to chastise him. New England's dark day wasn't due to biblical revelation or the American Revolution. It was solved by one man's logic prevailing over panic. My name is Folklore Shags, and I'll tell you about demons. Demons are a non-human entity that thrive off the sorrow of the human race. When you're being haunted by a demon, you often see shadows and hear noises. Demons are very dangerous and often want to harm the people they are stalking. Do not communicate with a demon. demon. You are opening a door and are more likely to be harmed. There are two types of possession, aerial possession and personal possession. To get a demon away, you need an exorcism. You bless the person, say prayers to weaken the demon, and use holy water to expel the demon. Afterwards, the person lives happily ever after, or not, but that's another story. Hey, um, I'm Calvin, and this is Tommy. We're going to be talking about the um, we're going to be talking about the history of Babe Ruth. Famous baseball player George Herman Ruth Jr., also known as Babe Ruth, was born on February 6, 1895, in Baltimore, Maryland. Ruth went on to break the slugging record and had the most home runs at his time. A quote written by Babe Ruth was, "Every strike brings me closer to my next home run." The play that he got remembered most for was when Babe Ruth of the New York Yankees in the 1932 World Series at Wrigley Field in Chicago. Babe Ruth, stole from the squad. He's a nightmare at the plate, and you don't want to face him at all. During Ruth's at bat, Ruth made a pointing gesture to the center field bleachers. It was a declaration that he would hit a home run to this part of the park. On the next pitch, Babe Ruth swings that bat of his, and he connects the ball. It heads into the stand, and he predicts it perfectly. Babe Ruth has just called his shot. Ever since that, kids would joke around and, and call their shot pretending to be Babe Ruth. And that is the history of George Herman Ruth Jr. holidays, a peaceful time. Sometimes we take that for granted. Christmas Eve, 1914, all along the Western Front, World War I, the Great European War, is underway. Horrendous casualties. It's about nine o'clock, and suddenly, the fighting stops. No gunfire, no artillery fire, no landmines going off. What's going on? 
people are taking a break from the fighting. Suddenly, from the British, Canadian, and French side, shh, 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 they hear Silent Night being sung in German by the Prussians. The British respond with their own version of O Tannenbaum. O Tannenbaum, O Tannenbaum, he bring in deine A Christmas truce is underway. The Germans put up a Christmas tree on their side. The French put up their own Christmas tree with candles lit. Heads pop up from trenches. It's safe. Suddenly, men get out of their trenches and walk towards no man's land. They shake each other's hands. They exchange gifts. The Germans bring Bavarian chocolate and beer. The French, the best red wine and cakes. There's chatter. Some speak English. Some speak German. Cigarettes are exchanged. It's Christmas. It rolls into dawn and under the first light, Germany challenges Britain to a game of soccer. Well, the Germans, they won that game. But word gets back to the high command. What's going on? There's no gunfire. The artillery, why aren't you lobbing more shells? I don't care if it's Christmas. And slowly, but surely, the great European conflict returns. By noon that day, a bullet fired from the German side, a bullet fired from the French side and hostilities continue. But for that brief moment in time, there was a truce, there was a peace on Christmas. My name is Jacob, and this is Elijah, and we'll be telling the story about Santa Claus. Once upon a time, there was a man named Saint Nick. He was also known to be a spirit named Santa Claus. He has flying reindeer attached to a big sled. He goes down your chimney and puts presents under your Christmas tree and fills up your stockings. He is a chubby old man with a big red suit. He had a red hat with a pom-pom on it. He lives in the North Pole with a big factory. He has a lot of elves that make the presents on Christmas Eve. He hops in his sled, cracks his whip, and yells, dash away, dash away, dash away. The oral tradition. Talk is talk, but a story lives on forever. We are the folklorists. And this is the new history. Till next time.